be. Um, let me just check that you can. Looks all good. Great. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes talking to you about retail activation for good. Um, it's an initiative that has been developed alongside the sustainable brands community here in the U.S., um, really to help brands and retailers better collaborate around activating brand purpose and sustainability at retail. So um, we heard from many of our clients, many community members, that one of the biggest challenges was just trying to figure out how to commercialize sustainability. How do you actually make sustainability less of a cost, a risk, or maybe even an inconvenience in, in some cases, and actually turn it into a driver of consumer demand so that it can actually drive behavior change um, and build brand equity and value over the long time. So this is what I'm going to kind of walk you through today. And this has been kind of in, in process, maybe for about two or three years now, to come up with a platform, a set of tools and a framework to enable brands and retailers to collaborate around this opportunity. So Retail Activation for Good exists as a guidebook. I think it's downloadable. I think everyone should have access to it through the main sustainable brands uh, uh, portal. Um, but it was part of an ex excellence in execution series. Um, you can see here, along with Films for Good, Social Media for Good, and you know, thinking about digitally printed packaging as well. Um, and what you'll find in this guide is a series of frameworks, tools, and case studies that walk you through how to actually activate brand purpose and sustainability at retail. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to kind of lift the hood on that a little bit, and I'm going to walk you through some of those principles and some of those approaches and show you a couple of case studies as well to kind of unpack how that process and how that approach actually works. So why now? Um, we have to forgive me. I'm not, I, I'm not that my, my, my finger isn't, isn't that much on the pulse um, in Turkey in terms of uh, the, the drive and the range of sustainable products and offerings within the marketplace. So what I what I what I've done here is share a share a recent graphic here from from the US, um, and it actually comes from Ipsos in partnership with the NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business, and it's something that. Um, you know, many brand marketeers and sustainability professionals are, are, are familiar with over here. But basically what it shows you is that over the past few years, there's been tremendous accelerated growth in sustainable brands, and sustainable products. Um, so over the, you know, over a six year period up into 2021, they were seeing, over, you know, seven, uh, over a 7 percent compound increase growth rate. Um, and actually, that means that they're growing, you know, almost three times faster than than more traditional brands in their categories. So definitely an acceleration for all the reasons that we all know, and I'm sure you've heard more about today. Um, a recent cultural trend tracker, and I, again, I think there might be some more up-to-date research on this from this year, but broadly speaking, it seems to hover around the same kind of benchmark that around 96% of consumers here in the US at least try to behave in ways that protect the planet, its people and its resources, at least some of the time. So in other words, Everyone at least says they try to do the right thing and they go into their shopping mission or the shopping trip with the very best of intentions. Um, when you actually look at those that actually follow through um, always or often and engage in sustainable behaviors, you can see it kind of drops off a little bit um, to, the, to the tune of about 44%. Now, imagine what that 44% could be worth to you as a brand or as a retailer, or ideally, brands and retailers working together to collaborate around converting that lost category opportunity. Um, so it's a huge amount of money is being left on the table, simply because we haven't necessarily developed the art, the tools, or the sophistication in many cases to be able to drive and motivate the right sustainable behavior change at point of sale when people are making their buying decisions. So this is really what this, um, retail activation for good was designed to do. Now, we know from, from, the, from the research that there are several reasons, several common barriers as to why people feel that they can't. Often it's because sustainable brands are gen, you know, command a price premium and they're sometimes more expensive. But the second most, the second biggest barrier is that people often don't know where to start. And what's interesting about that stat is that's as true for consumers as it is for brand and marketing professionals. In other words, not only do people not really know what brands to buy or why they should buy them or what, what the kind of sustainable benefit is from doing so, but internally at a corporate level, when brands and retailers are working, trying to work together to figure this stuff out, many say they also don't know where to start. 
either. And maybe lack the concepts, the language, the tools to be able to implement that and execute that with excellence at retail. So you can see there's a, you know, a real need for this across the board. And certainly here in the US, when you look at retailers like Walmart or Amazon or even Target, there's a huge, huge commitment to ESG, let's say, and, and working with suppliers to help the retailers themselves actually kind of move forward and accelerate their own ESG commitments. Um, but when push comes to shove, um, actually, and this was a, a recent report from the um, from Boston Consulting Group, that actually less than 20% of retailers here in the US are actually on track to meet their sustainability goals and commitments. So what that means is there's increasing pressure and increasing demand and increasing expectation from retailers that suppliers and brands will step up and work together to help deliver these goals and commitments. So there's never been more of a commercial imperative to make sure that this can happen and this can happen well and effectively. So that's why Retail Activation for Good was born, basically. And to cover some of the principles, um, there's 10. It's 10 steps. It is fairly linear in the time, in the way that we kind of work through it and, and, and tackle some of these steps. But broadly speaking, what you see on the left-hand side are, are strategic principles. And what you see on the right-hand side are more executional principles that will drive best in, you know, best in class compliance and implementation at retail. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to concentrate more on the left hand side to unpack some of those strategic principles to help you understand how to build a case and how to begin to activate brand purpose and sustainability at retail. So we talked about the fact that the biggest opportunity and the biggest barrier is as often the case um, is that many people don't know where to start. And that's as true for consumers as it is for brand and marketing and sustainability professionals. So a good first step, um, something which I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is, is Sustainable Brands Nine Sustainable Behaviours. Um, a, really a really good first move into understanding what kind of behaviours, what kind of shifts can we implement that can actually have a disproportionate or transformative effect. Um, I think I know the sustainable brands community talk about this a lot as these are the things that they believe can make sustainability more accessible, and more aspirational and more rewarding. The way I like to kind of think about these actually is we know that many people want to do the right thing. They're just not sure about doing the right things. And this makes it very straightforward and very easy to identify what are some of the right things that we can get behind and we can rally behind to make sure we drive that that consumer behavior change. So once we've identified the right sustainable behavior, the next, the next task to do is to then map that back against the retailer. And the way that we do that is actually really quite simple. Um, it took us a long time to get to this level of simplicity, but when you put it into practice, it actually works really well. And it really comes down to two things. It's to what degree does your retailer, or your customer believe um, or support your commitment to sustainability? And how much of a commercial priority are you to their category? And when you kind of put it against these access and you plot it against this matrix, you kind of realize that that leaves you with four potential options. If you are a low commercial priority and you have a low commitment to sustainability, then um, lo and behold, uh, you're going to have to pay a lot. <laughs> you have to pay a lot for support, feature, display, media tactics. If you're a high commitment to sustainability, but you're still low commercial priority, then in those top to top joint value planning meetings that I'm sure many of you have, you know, a few times a year, um, then really the trick there is to align to the vision and the ESG commitments of the retailer and trying to find common ground and demonstrate that you can actually align to those priorities as a means for kind of conversation and then further commercial innovation. If you've got a high commercial priority but low sustainability commitment, and I'll walk you through a case study of this in a second, then actually the best way is to kind of collaborate on programs. It might be across your own brand portfolio and pooling resources to create more impact and splash and more credibility, or it actually might might be a cross category platform where you're working with other brands across the category or across multiple categories in some case to drive the behavior change that you're actually looking for. But if you're in that fortunate position where you're in that top right hand quadrant, which let's face it, everyone really wants to be, then actually you actually have the opportunity to work with the retailer to completely reinvent the category and start to think about how you can engage shoppers in a much more, uh, much more engaging and positive way over time. 
So I'll share an example here. So this is from Target. This was developed by Target themselves, actually. Um, back in 2020, uh, Black Beyond Measure was, was launched around, I think it was around uh, Black Business Month. And it was really uh, to demonstrate support for Black-owned businesses um, and social justice causes. So starting with some of those uh, key sustainable behaviors, you can see that very much moving towards the kind of social aspect of some of those behaviors, so supporting women and girls, expanding equity and opportunity and showing up, and then thinking about where does that sit within Target's own relationship? Well, it's its relationship with itself. <laughs> so there's no better opportunity than to shift this right to the top right hand of the quadrant and actually kind of reinvent the category. And that's exactly what Target did. So um, introduced uh, Black Beyond Measure was the was was initiative to introduce more black owned businesses, more black owned brands into the retail experience, the tune of over 500 extra uh, SKUs um, and an investment of over two billion dollars that also continued into investing 10 million dollars to support social justice causes, as well as allocating 50 percent of the promotional and editorial calendar specifically to support black owned businesses. So completely changing the dynamic and the assortment at retail to more accurately and more proportionally reflect the value and the representation of black owned businesses across the store. So it had a tremendous impact, huge impact, uh, still going, still very much a part of um, Target's equity. The biggest challenge, though, that we find and we often have to try and reconcile is the notion of turning sustainability into a driver of purchase intent. So often we find that it exists at a top level within an organization as a, as a commitment, as a goal. But as we all know, trying to translate that day to day into business as usual can often be a really hard challenge. And when you kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're butting up against your brand plan or your quarterly commercial pressures, then what tends to happen is we default to kind of, you know, business as usual and, and, and focus on ROI. So unless you can connect sustainability to those drivers of purchase intent, then frankly, often it doesn't get a look in and it gets side, you know, it gets, uh, uh, passed over and sidelined because it cannot be justified um, as part of the commercial plan moving forward. So the most important thing to do is to actually connect your sustainability goals and commitments to the category needs state. So why, why, why are people shopping the category and what's actually making them purchase your brand or purchase the retailer's category in the first place? So I'll give you an example. Um, Brand that we all know and love, uh, PNG. It's our home. That's their in big internal global platform for sustainability, a bit like Unilever's um, sustainable living plan. And uh, many, many brands sit underneath this platform as their commitment to helping PNG accelerate and meet its, its ESG goals. So we had this top level corporate driven ESG platform. The challenge was then how do you pull that down to a brand level? And how do you make that shopper relevant to drive behavior change at point of sale? So looking at it, um, some research was done to kind of understand why, why brands, what role, what value PNG's brands can actually play in helping people live a more sustainable lifestyle. And it came back time and time again that it really came down to ease and convenience. Many of these categories, Tide, Crest, Cascade, laundry, bathroom, dental care, they're fairly loyal, they're fairly well entrenched, they're fairly habitual categories that are bought time and time again based on performance. So it really is a functional performance driven proposition in many cases. And what they kind of realized is that looking across the board, that Tide in specifically had made a commitment to try and decarbonize laundry. And so decarbonizing laundry was about trying to reduce scope three emissions because they're the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases, you know, across the across the entire value chain. And what they realized is that actually Tide has the same performance, the same efficacy, um, even if you kind of wash your clothes at a much lower temperature, thereby saving 90 percent of your energy. So washing clothes on cold rather than warm or, or, or hot, let's say. And the same principle then applied to Crest in terms of water usage and also Cascade as well. So when we were kind of thinking about how do you kind of activate this big platform and make it relevant to these brands, what we needed to do is understand the, the consumer buying journey or, or the purchase decision journey and think about all the steps 
across that journey to try and identify where is the biggest barrier and where is the moment that matters. Well, we had a big, a really big clue because we already knew the research was saying that um, it's about convenience and making it easy. So convenience here is one of those big macro barriers that influences behavior along with cognitive or emotional resistance right at the front end of the journey. Uh, poor perceived value at a point of sale when you're switching or making that buying decision, commitment when you're looking to continually to kind of entrench that habit, or actually building community and reward when you're trying to perpetuate that habit. So we had some behavioral heuristics that we knew we could lean into to try and figure out what we needed to do to shift the behavior. And, and de deconstructing this case study, what we can see is that the moment the matter sits somewhere under convenience between the uh, intent on taking the steps but not knowing how so going back to that second biggest classic barrier we talked about and making it easy to search for potential solutions that can help so if you can completely deconstruct this process and unpack everything that we went to start by looking at the sustainable behavior whether it's about being energy smart and switching to more renewable resources to conserve energy at home it's then mapping tide and crest um to uh to the retailers uh ESG commitments and commercial priorities. And you can see that from here, looking at Walmart specifically, when it came to Tide at least, um, a very high commercial value, but still very early on its sustainability journey. And, and you know, Tide being a, a laundry detergent, um, you know, impressions, let's say, of, of harsh chemicals, superior cleaning performance, so may not necessarily intuitively be able to lean into something that feels sustainable. So there was an opportunity here to kind of help them gather more credibility and support by working with other brands across the PG portfolio in order to deliver that message. To address that barrier of inconvenience and not knowing where to start, what happened is those brands came together at Walmart, created a little website, which demonstrated how you could make savings on energy and water as also money um, in a very simple and easy way. Learn about the little things, the small differences you could make, along with a really simple kind of add to cart functionality. So you could buy those brands and put you in the, put them in the basket. So you can see how all these things added up in across our process into a really straightforward and really effective campaign. If you don't have a big idea and you need to try and figure out how to activate your brand and pull it through, then um, the fifth step in the process is actually what we're calling kind of pulling through on purpose, building on a model that is inherently part of the sustainable brands um, approach. Um, thinking about this intersection between what the world needs, what people want and what the brand uniquely offers. Some of you may be fairly, uh, familiar with this model. What we realized is that actually when it comes to driving behavior chains, there's a big difference between what people want and what people do. We already seen that in the intention action gap. <laughs> um, and often, as we know in research, people can't tell you what they want through, you know, at least the claimed responses, because we often don't know until we see it. Um, so it, what people want is less important. It's more about what's going to drive the behavior change. And that's where the intention action gap comes in. That's why we need to know what's driving intention. What are people actually doing? And where is the gap? And then how big is that gap? Because that, that size of that gap gives us the sense of the commercial opportunity that's being lost. And therefore, the size of the prize we can achieve if we activate against it. So here's an example of something that we here at Grounded did um, with the client Indigo. Um, some of you may be familiar with Indigo, uh, large company here in the US, very much focused on delivering technologies and solutions to the farming community to accelerate regenerative agriculture. And what happened is at that stage, they were thinking of shifting their focus um, from, uh, from a B2B to, to also a B2C. And, and wanted to launch a series of um, CPG products, consumer packaged good products, flour, rice and oats, I think, were the three lines that they were looking to um, looking to launch. So they came to us and said, hey, guys, we know this is your thing. How can you help us create this? 
so taking the same process, we went through the whole process. And in this case, this was this was for Whole Foods, the retailers, Whole Foods. We realized that we went through that whole process we just outlined, but we didn't really have an effective idea. We didn't really have a platform that we felt confident that the retailer would buy into or really help capture the equity or the positioning or the unique value proposition of the brand. So we went through this exercise. What does the world need? Well, it needs more regenerative agriculture. Why? Because that helps sequester more carbon into the soil. What does the brand uniquely stand for? Well, in this case, Indigo is all about harnessing nature to help farmers sustainably feed the planet. And where was the intention action gap? Well, the gap was that mum actually didn't realize that buying commodities like flour or rice or oats, which are often on the bottom shelf and often bought, uh, you know, uh, uh, private label because they were cheaper, because they were an invisible part of her cooking. She didn't actually realize that these products could actually demonstrate and deliver a disproportionate benefit, not only in terms of the health of her meals and the health of her family, but also for the health of the planet. So there was a disconnect in her mind between what the product is, the health benefits that it can have at an individual level, but the broader sustainability benefits it can have if you tie it back to regenerative agriculture. So that was the intention action gap that we needed to close. So as you can see, then, once we knew that and we'd done our due diligence across the path to purchase to figure out where the moment that matters, we we're able to come up with a platform, a retail execution uh, program tactically across the purchase, path to purchase that reframed the value of a simple box of rice or oats or flour into something that could actually lead and help mum feel that she was contributing to a healthier planet because every cup would be good for you good for the farmers and also good for the planet and when you think about this model and take this model to the next degree and think about tracking and measurement you realize that it provides a really nice triple bottom line metric because you can look at it from a people planet and profit perspective and make sure you're measuring the right thing so you can justify the commercial impact but you can also justify the social environmental impact as well thanks for listening um this is retail activation for good um i think if you want to know more about it um please drop me a line very happy to share the toolkit and also very happy to kind of walk you through uh, the one day workshop or design sprint that accompanies this series to allow you to get to a, a an activation platform and a commercial selling story believe it or not in one day um so can't say fairer than that thanks very much for having me and uh, wish you all the very best <laughs>